This is Star Talk. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And today, uh, we haven't figured out a title for this. Uh, Chuck, you want to call it Mafia Malcolm? Mafia Malcolm, That's where yes. You're going. Yeah, we're sticking with that. that oh my God, good. how catchy is that? <laughs> I Chuck. should get. I, some <laughs> advertising company should be recruiting me right now. <laughs> Chuck Nice, my co host. Chuck, always good to have you here. Always a pleasure. So the Malcolm of which you speak is, I, I, I got to call him a special guest because this guy is out and about. I'm afraid to put him on my show because that means he's not otherwise writing his next book. <laughs> like I'm in, his, in the way of this man's productive career in progress. Malcolm Gladwell, welcome back to Star Talk. Thank you. It's yeah, a real honor. Uh, yeah. We, had, we had you on stage live. It might have been five or I six years I remember that. Ago. Back Excellent. when those things happened, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you and, are, and just one quick correction, Neil. Malcolm is so prolific; he's actually writing a book right now. <laughs> While we're talking, <laughs> Malcolm is in the midst of composing his next work. Because, <laughs> like, I, I'm very serious. I don't like taking time away from people that they could be doing some productive. Uh, but this... you, a whole string of bestsellers, Blink. I, I, forgive me, I haven't read all of them, but I've read many of them. And Blink, Outliers, The Tipping Outliers. Point. Yeah. There's some very famous books in here. Uh, David and Goliath, checking the list here. What the Dogs Saw. Um, Why don't we just a, start a, a with new... the stuff Malcolm hasn't written? And then... <laughs> Back into <laughs> it whatever... Might, right, it might take a less time. <laughs> uh, you have one of my favorite podcasts uh, online right now, Revisionist History. And now in its sixth season. Ooh. And uh, this is where you sort of dissect a commonly held truth and figure out, well, maybe it's not as true as people think. It's a brilliant format and, it, and you're going strong. And you've got a new book, The Bomber Mafia. Okay, there's your, there, I, now I see your connection. See? Uh, the Bomber Mafia, a dream, a temptation, but, and the longest night in the Second World War. Man. Yeah. Man, we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, so, uh, let me ask you, Malcolm, you, you, last time you were on, we discussed sort of sociology and the human condition about which you've written, uh, quite a bit. And what I've found is that you, instead of just teaching people textbook style, uh, instead of only telling stories, you've, you found a way to stitch together first person narrative or a narrative that directly relates to another human being who we can think about their existence and the science related to it. And that's an art, the way you've, uh, that, uh, that's an art. So are, would you suggest that if scientists want to communicate, they should adopt your methods here? Mm. All right, I'm gonna handle this one for you, Malcolm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> I don't, you know, I would only say that the if you're a scientist, I mean, you were saying earlier, jokingly, that you didn't, you you were worried that if you interviewed me, I wouldn't have time to write. I don't want my scientists spending all their time writing popular books. I want them doing science, <laughs> right? So. I mean, I want people to specialize in what they do best. We're not selecting out our astrophysicists and our chemists and our biologists for their ability to explain their ideas to the public. We're selecting them for their ability to push the boundaries of science. And it may well be that the thing that makes them good at pushing the boundaries of science makes them bad at explaining their ideas to the general public. I'm fine with that trade-off. You know, the reason God invented journalists is that we can come along and do that job for them. Um, I was so wondering I, where journalists came from. <laughs> God invented them. God, <laughs> now God that's in, his, that's in his infinite wisdom, yes. said there was a role for someone to play, uh, to be intermediary between the genius and the public. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what that's what we're doing. You know, I'm not I'm not pushing the boundaries of science. I'm just telling stories and standing between uh, the public and the science. And that's that's what we that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, so, but, but you have to boost your science literacy so that you don't fumble over. The, the, the content, right? Interesting. Yeah, no, although, you know, um, what I've discovered is that, first of all, I steer clear of those areas where I don't feel, you'll find that I, you know, I, 
I don't write about the the most complicated corners of medicine or biology. I stick pretty much to those areas of science that I find personally accessible. So I do think it's you know it's tricky. Not everything can be explained to a general public. You know, it's like the the remember when Stephen Hawking's A Short History of Time was a bestseller, and there was a kind of an open joke about whether anyone who was buying it was reading it because like yeah. that is not a you know the idea that you know you some a, a standard normally educated human being could read that book and make sense of it is a little bit of a stretch i i, I didn't have a program i got like 10 pages in i was like you know what this is just so far above my pay grade that I, <laughs> but, so you know there is a there are real limits to whether um, to certain parts, whether well, certain parts of science can be made accessible, mm -hmm. not sure they should be. You uh, know, uh, the, Malcolm, you're, you're you're deep in the publishing world. Was it true, or is it just a story? I heard that the publishers wanted to actually find out if people were reading *A Brief History of Time* by Stephen Hawking. So, mm -hmm. for in some set of books, they put in like a coupon and said, "Mail this in and get a hundred dollars." And like nobody mailed it in because they never got that far in the book. <laughs> no, yeah, no. It's like that was. There's a famous story about um, the guy who in uh, Ron Popeil. Remember him, the pitch man on TV. Yeah, pocket, pocket his, fisherman. Pocket, his dad invented the pocket fisherman. Oh. And when his father, who was his name was S.J. S.J. was once asked, was once someone once said to him, the pocket fisherman, you know, it doesn't work. And S.J. said very wisely, it's not for using. It's forgiving. Ah. <laughs> Whoa! That's an excellent quote. And, and that, and you know, honest. I feel like <laughs> I feel like the Stephen Hawking book was for was right. forgiving, not for reading. So, can I ask you this then, as a person who is a, uh, you know, almost, uh, I mean, you know, on the level of a sociologist because of so much that you have written about and studied on human uh, kind and human condition. Do you think that as a society we are pulling away from scientific literacy, and if so, why would that be? Well, I wonder about this. So this 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 question comes up a lot about is there something distinctive about the moment we're living in and our and popular attitudes towards expertise of one kind or another. And I would science say, Malcolm, your books, they bring people into the science and they show how the science manifests. So so uh, I think you are a force of good in yeah. in this in this uh, on this landscape. But go on. But I I was going to say. I think the people who say that we're living in a uniquely anti-scientific moment have a short memory. So let me give you two stories from my mom. My mom grows up in Jamaica and gets a scholarship to a boarding school in the 1930s. And she's reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. And she learns to her, reading some section on, I don't know what the section was, on race or something, she learns to her horror that the Encyclopedia Britannica considers black people to be genetically inferior to white people, right? So this is 1930, whatever it is, seven in Jamaica. Then she tries to marry my father, who is white, and discovers to her horror that a good majority of people think that it is not just kind of casually a bad idea for white people to marry black people, but like something that is, you know, a profound problem for the future of civilization, right? Because they believe that the mixing of the races represents. Those are two pretty firmly held views of that period. Yeah, and, that are, and eugenics was flying high at the time. And eugenics yeah. was flying high. Like, first of all, that's 70 years ago, not that right. long ago. And those are two crazy notions that were held by, among other things, the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? right. So are we, have we made progress? I kind of think so. Like, no one's saying stuff that crazy today, right. at least not on that level of... The Encyclopedia Britannica today does not have those kind of whoppers in it. Right. Wait, 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 um, wait. But just to be fair to, to Chuck's question, um, mm -hmm. there were scientists saying that at the time. So the fact that the Encyclopedia Britannica echoes this is not being anti-science. They're just oh. promulgating. They're just promulgating the science bad of science. The anthropologists yeah. of the day. That's yeah. different. Yeah. All right. All right. So the, the, this brings this opens up some categories here because uh, this concept of skin color and race, as as we know in the history of this country, is quite. Uh, colorful as to put it mildly and that is a very deep deeply um, endemic f 
feature of society as so many other topics are that you have addressed in your books. Mm -hmm. So do you have a certain um, a, a, a priority order with which you say, I want to do this topic because it's the most inflammatory or because you have the best stories to tell? And, and, and that then shapes your books. Mm. I think it starts from what question is meaningful to me. Um, not sort of globally meaningful, but meaningful at the moment. So, for example, since we're on the subject of race, which is meaningful for me for personal reasons, you know, because I come from a mixed race background, because I find that issue in this current season of revisionist history, I have a whole thing about HBCUs. And why don't we, it's all about recognizing- Historically, the, black colleges and universities. Yeah, 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 and about the particular role they play in American education that's largely unrecognized. and. It was super interesting to me, both because, um, you know, for personal reasons that's near and dear to my heart, but also I'm, I've always been interested in kind of um, managing or learning to understand the relationship between um, the kind of the, the dominant community in the United States and minorities. Because I am an outsider, I'm a, I'm a Canadian, I'm a half Jamaican, I'm, a, I'm all these outsider things. That question of how does the dominant group interact with people who aren't dominant, it's just, it's just interesting to me. I mean, it's just like, it's at the core of what I think about when I, when I think about the world. And when I think about my mother's evolution for a moment, so she grows up in a world where uh, any Jamaican would, or any West Indian would, where people in positions of authority are as likely to be almost more likely to be black as white. Mm -hmm. So she grew up in a world where the doctors were black, where the teachers were black, where the politicians were black, where the lawyers were black. And so it never occurred to her that these were opportunities that weren't open to black people or that black people couldn't do those jobs. And then she comes to North America and suddenly she doesn't see any black doctors or black lawyers or black politicians, at least in the 70s. Um, and that transition is super interesting, right? Mm -hmm. To And I was, you know, I'm a kid and I'm observing this, I'm observing my mother go through this transition um, and trying and struggling with it. I mean, we lived in a town where there were two black people, my mom and actually three, and these twin adopted girls of the local Lutheran minister, the Goosey twins. That's it. Three people. Wow. A town of 7,000 people, right? Then and my mother has to navigate that fact. All of a sudden, she's the only person who looks like her and it's weird. And it's also strange for the other people who've never seen a well-spoken, well-educated, you know, uh, black person before. Can right? I touch her hair? Can I? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. there was Oh, no. It wasn't. You know what it was, Neil? I wonder whether you've ever gotten this. When my mom was in England going to school in the 50s, what she got was people wanting to touch her skin to see whether it, quote, it would come it would, off. It would mm -hmm. rub off. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that yeah. was the. Yeah. So there's, so, a, there's a whole I, I would there. just tell them that it's paint. I tell you, it does, right. it does <laughs> come up, but uh, quite frankly, you need a special solution. So, and I can't share that with you, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say this: this is not as a, not even as a pushback, but just as an addendum. It may be an eight, universally, but it's like a twelve for black people in America. That's the yeah. only difference. Yeah. You know, that's the difference is mm -hmm. that okay. there's an extra, there's a, it's an extra, it, it, extra it goes extra. It's yeah. extra in America. For, and like you said about your mom, you know, here she is mm -hmm. seeing a society where black people do hold authority and positions of authority. I mean, that was anathema in, a, in America and uh, subsequently North America. And, you know, it, it, it's in my childhood growing up, I had a pediatrician and uh, my mother's doctor were black this 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 is part of my every american child school child should be required to spend at least one year of their life attending a school in atlanta why because that's the american city where they are most likely to see black people in positions of authority lots of them right a really up, good up experience. and down the spectrum that's right up and down the spectrum right you go to a restaurant in atlanta you will see you know 50 percent of the seats in a restaurant will be occupied by black people, chances are. You go to the doctor, chances are your doctor will be a black person. You need to be exposed, people should be exposed to that, to understand mm -hmm. that their little world is not representative of the world out there. You know, I think internal 
years abroad would be a really good idea for America. <laughs> I, like, right? I like that. Internal <laughs> years <laughs> abroad. Yeah. Yeah. No, you don't have to go to Africa to see black people. Go to Atlanta. <laughs> go to Atlanta. No, I, I, said, I was just in, just in Atlanta. I love Atlanta for that very reason. I just think Atlanta, like, you know, it's just it's a different place. Same thing with Washington, D.C., by the way. Same, very similar kind mm -hmm. of worlds where you just get a, that's a, to me a much more realistic Picture. Except in Congress, but anywhere else, you'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, well, we're accepting Congress from this guy. I'm talking about Washington, D.C., outside of Outside Capitol. of government. Okay, <laughs> okay. we've got to take a quick break. When we come back, more of our exclusive interview with Malcolm Gladwell and all that makes his brain tick on Star Talk. We're back, Star Talk. I got Malcolm Gladwell in the house and Chuck Nice, my co host here. Chuck, you're yes. tweeting Chuck Nice comics still. Well, thank you, sir. Yes. And, right. and the more you say it, the more I have to keep that handle. Okay. <laughs> and, and not, Malcolm, that I, not that I care. I, I love that you say it. Uh, and Malcolm, t tell me your social media handles. Do I know them? Hold on. I think I'm at Gladwell on Twitter. I'm really bad on social media. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an old dude. I, oh, you want stuff. people to like read your books? <laughs> what, the, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think it's at, I think it's at Gladwell. That's it. That's it. it's at Gladwell. I'm, I'm the only Gladwell on Twitter, as far as I can tell. Uh, Gladwell. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. All right. So let's get back into this. Um, uh, we left off uh, with the recommendation that everyone take a. A, a, a staycation in the United States and just visit Atlanta. <laughs> just no, you. they got to go to school in Atlanta. You got to live in Atlanta. You can't just visit. You can't just I, visit. You need Atlanta. to stay there. You need to stay there for a while. Move around. If you're, you know, I was I was on this trip when I was in Atlanta. I was going for a run, and I just to be clear, died. you're you're an avid runner, correct? I am an avid runner. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm running around, and this guy starts running next to me. We start chatting, and he's a white guy. And I said, oh, what do you do? He goes, I'm a, a uh, uh, he's at my medical resident. I said, oh, where'd you go to med school? He goes, Morehouse. And I said, wait a second, how many white people go to, go to University of, to go to Morehouse Medical School? He goes, well, I was a small number. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I love that fact. And he wanted, he got interested in medicine because he went to Africa, spent 10 years in Nigeria and Kenya, came back and said, uh, I need, you know, I'd like to become a doctor to help people. But it seemed at that point, after 10 years in Africa, it was natural for him to want to go to a place like Morehouse Medical School, right? Mm -hmm. He was comfortable around people who didn't look like him. Mm -hmm. And that just tells me that, that that's the advantage of people who live a cosmopolitan life, who get out of their own little worlds, that they think this, they, they don't think twice about. And Malcolm, there's got to be a lot of unmined stories about going out fish out of water or really they're in water it's just a different different water right i mean i remembered um my at my elementary school and i don't want this to be about me here because we don't have much you know how often do we have malcolm gladwell in the house but in elementary school by whatever measures of exams that were administered i was not put in the special the the the, the, the advanced class the advanced class got to take a foreign language they got special teachers that all of this was going on, and, and I knew uh, I wanted to do that, but the system prevented it. I was one of three black people in my elementary school. All right, in middle school, I go to Lexington, Massachusetts, because my father has an appointment up at Harvard, a, a one-year fellowship. And so I'm living in Lexington, Massachusetts, and I go to the regional middle school. There are three black people in that school once again. I get the highest grades in the school in four semesters. And I graduate getting accolades and accolades and awards and I got pins and 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 and, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, um, I don't know what's going on here. Okay, why in one place they say I'm not I'm not deserving and in another place I'm at the top of the class, but I was not thinking and I should have, you know, this is good for the white people <laughs> to see this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, right, right. It's, it's so, because there's a black kid, one of three black children in this middle school, and uh, untouchable by it. Plus, I was I was on all the sports, so I could like outrun them and yeah. out out. Yeah. It. And so I think maybe every every white kid who who's been told like from the Encyclopedia Britannica and its derivatives mm. over the decades that. 
they somehow represent some platform of superiority. You need stories like this, perhaps. They need, yeah. need to get or, their clock cleaned by, <laughs> by, by <laughs> you in, in middle school. However, okay. Neil, the, uh, the other consideration <laughs> is that uh, uh, up in Massachusetts, you were going to school with slow, dumb white people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, there's another one. I, I, you know, I don't want to like d rub it in, but but you know, I grew up, my time up until then was in the Bronx, right? And so there's a basketball court. And so I'm there and I go to take a pickup game of basketball and someone is ready to shoot. And I jump to block the shot and I end up blocking his shot with my elbow because I jumped 18 inches higher than was necessary. To... <laughs> Wait, <laughs> that's funny. Right, you, you, like, you expect I... to block it with your hand. But I kept rising, and the ball, he didn't jump higher with me, and my elbow blocked the shot. And I said, Wait, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> Neil, wait, I have a question for you, Neil. Yeah. Um, how tall are you? I'm 6'2". Uh, six okay. 6'2". Six so I was reading, Just uh, this is a sobering note in this discussion. I was reading just the other day this big discussion of school suspensions. For some reason, for long reasons, which I can get into or not, I've become really fascinated by, by school suspensions. And... As you know, the data says that uh, black kids, particularly uh, black males, are way more likely to be suspended yep. for the same offense than their white equivalents, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there is a nuance to this that broke my heart, which is when you look at all of the variables that most predict being suspended, being black is one, being a black male is two, being a tall black male is the overwhelming predictor. There is something about, so I can equalize everything. And if you're, if you're tall and black and male, you are getting singled out for punishment in a way that um, outstrips every other Very, conceivable variable. Yeah. Well, it's hard to miss you. It's hard, but there's something. You're tall and black. <laughs> but it's, it's triggering something. Yeah. And like, yeah. and. And the reason is so it's, it's important for a million different reasons. But this is the kind of thing that in a million years, the teachers or principals making those decisions would never no. think. They might think, am I singling out a kid because he's black or am I singling out a kid because he's a black boy? They would never think they were singling out someone unfairly because they were tall. So I, I, was, I was typically the second tallest kid in my class. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I wasn't oddly tall. And, but I had very gentle demeanor. So mm -hmm. I, I was never at risk of sort of a truant uh, conduct. Uh, I, was, I, I never got into fights. Other people get into fights, I never got into fights. Were you also uh, a good student? Well, it depends what you mean by good. I'd well, very, I'm saying- Very average grades. I had very average grades uh, for most of my life. Yeah. Well, when you're black, the expectations are lower. So <laughs> you, you, you are, are a great student. <laughs> you are a really good student. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to do that. That's a joke, people. That's a joke. Okay. So Malcolm, let's 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 talk about your your your, your current book. It has yes. many more words in the title than any of your other books. A lot of words. So lot please words. please defend yourself there. <laughs> it has an unwieldy subtitle. Uh, a dream of temptation in the longest night of the Second World War. Um it is uh it's and it's a different book than any I've ever written. It's not a, it's not a. It doesn't go in a million directions. It's not a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a not a pure history book, but very close to it. It's a story about this weird little bit of history in the Second World War, which was a group of pilots down in Alabama, who thought they had solved one of the uh, most difficult physics problem problems in modern war, which is how to drop a plane, a bomb from a plane with uh, with a high degree of accuracy, which if you think about it is, that's an insanely hard problem, right? You've got, you're six miles up, you're going 250 miles an hour, you're dropping a large heavy object through a constantly changing air pressure, weather blown by, blown by winds, uh, different temperatures, to a, to a small target on the ground that might be obscured by clouds. I mean, it's insanely difficult, right? And, and most people don't know. I say, correct me if I'm wrong, Malcolm, because surely you researched this. Was it something like 80% of bombs dropped in the Second World War missed their target? 
Oh yeah, and not just by a little bit, by an enormous <laughs> amount. Yeah. Right. The British, the we, British do a study early in the war called the Hull Report, and. They think they're doing a really good job of hitting German targets, and they discover they're like off by as much as seven miles. Mm. <laughs> That's how bad it is. Gentlemen, so I'm sorry to report, we're actually bombing ourselves. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you want right. to be high enough so that anti-aircraft can't get you. So yeah. this, they're competing forces on your accuracy. So they, these guys think they've solved this problem. And they then go to the next stage and say, if we've solved this problem, we can solve the problem of war, right? Because we we want we can wage war in a way that doesn't result in hundreds of thousands of civilian casualties. We can bring a city to its knees without destroying it. We can take on our enemy without having to use armies and infantry and navy and we can just use bombers that just precisely take out the thing we want to take out. The the aqueducts, the power plant, the bridges and they'll 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 surrender, right? Um, and this incredible dream, which is hatched in Montgomery of Alabama, by the way, the only incredible dream hatched there until <laughs> ever hatched in uh, Montgomery. Uh, no, no, until wait, 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 until the Montgomery bus boycott uh, in 1965. Oh, there you go. Uh, is it 65? No, 55. I'm 55, sorry. 55 in the 50s, definitely. Yes. Anyway, um, they hatch this dream and they take it into the Second World War and. They, they, they ascend the ranks of the Air Force in the Second World War with this incredibly ambitious, disruptive idea that the only thing that matters is the bomber because the bomber can drop bombs with perfect accuracy wherever they want. And they run into the reality of warfare. And um, this dream and its confrontation with reality ends in spectacular fashion um, over the skies of Tokyo in 1945. And my book is about that journey from the hatching of the dream in Montgomery in, in the mid-30s to its kind of cataclysmic failure um, in, in over Japan in the summer of 1945. All right, so that's the, the dream. What's the, What's the temptation? You, you, wait, you don't mean the firebombing of Tokyo, do you? No. Well, the firebombing is what results from the failure of their dream. I know. So the temptation is, the dream is we can clean up modern warfare and use these perfectly aimed bombs. The temptation is, when that strategy doesn't work, is just to say, you know, F it. Let's just, let's just firebomb everything down and burn everything down. Oh, yeah, okay. And my dreamers won't take up the temptation, but somebody else does. And that's oh. the darkest chapter of the Second World War. Chuck, oh, I interrupted you. What, you. what were you gonna say? No, he answered my question. I said, if, the, I, if that's the dream, what is the temptation? But now I'm intrigued to know who is this Darth Vader figure who comes in and creates the darkest chapter in the Second World War, which God, I mean, that's such a bloody war. How, I mean, to say that this is person is the author of the darkest chapter, wow. Wow. Darkest Hardest chapter of the darkest war. Yeah, like, the, the darkest chapter of, of the time. darkest war. Who is this Darth Vader-like creature? A man named General Curtis LeMay, one of the most infamous or famous, depending on your perspective, uh, military aviators of the 20th century, um, who uh, who's just an extraordinary character. I mean, the most kind of brutal, ruthless, unsentimental, brilliant. Um, and you know, he goes on from there. Of course, if you remember, he's he was. I fr I lost count. I think at nine or ten, the number of Hollywood movies that had Curtis LeMay. A, a villain based on Curtis LeMay in there. I mean, Dr. Strangelove. There's a Curtis LeMay figure in Dr. Strangelove. I see. So he's influenced um, a, 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 what do you call it, a character type. A, yes. He, is, a he stands he's for... Become, he's become a trope. A trope. Yeah. yeah. Yes. He, he stands for the crazy cold warrior. He's, the he, nuclear wow. finger on the button. He's the guy. So LeMay is the guy who... Napalm is, is invented in the Second World War, not Vietnam, for the express purposes of burning down Japanese cities because they were made of wood and they were highly flammable. And the first wood person and paper. to really... A lot of walls are paper. And paper, yeah, yeah. yes, uh -huh. exactly. And the, the first person to use napalm to its fullest extent was this man, Curtis LeMay. The first person with the kind of gumption to say, uh, I'm going to give up on all traditional forms of warfare, and I'm just going to drop so many firebombs on these flammable cities that I will literally burn my enemy out. And that's what he does. And he kills in the summer of 45. He firebombs. He burns to the ground 66 Japanese cities and maybe kills close to a million civilians. I mean, mm -hmm. it's yeah. it's an astonishing. The, if you list the, mil the people in the 
20th century, who were responsible for the most civilian deaths. Uh, Mao's one, Stalin's two, Hitler's three, Pol Pot's four, and Curtis LeMay is five, and American is number five. Mm -hmm. um, wow. It's well, a, I'm certainly adding him to my list of people I'd like to have at a cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Just one thing I'll add, just to end the segment on a completely down note. Um, <laughs> uh, napalm, at least of the f variety they used in Vietnam, maybe the early versions weren't quite this potent. Um, the napalm doesn't just simply burn. Wow. It burns at an extremely high temperature, yeah. like thousands of degrees. And so what happens is where napalm is dropped, it sucks all of the oxygen out of that region. So even if you were not burned by the oxygen, you burned by the flames and the temperatures, you suffocated from the absence of oxygen. And in, in firebombing tactics in Tokyo, uh, I don't know if you've ever done this. This is, uh, I've done this. I, I used to do it when I still put as many candles in a birthday cake as my age, which I, of course I've stopped. But if you put candles around the rim of a cake, all right, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get at least 10, but ideally like 20, just do that and then ignite them and just watch what happens. All candles point directly radially into the center of the cake. Are you serious? Because what you've, you've heated the air, not only oh. outside the cake, but inside the middle of the cake, but there's more heat in the inside of the cake than outside, right? because they're all sort of focused there. And so if you heat the air there, that air rises, other air comes in from outside to replace it, pushing the candle flames inward. So while they were firebombing these cities, you don't have to ignite every square inch. You just have to make a circle. And then all the, yes. the air will come in and push the flames and completely incinerate everything in the center of the circle. Is that but, what they call a firestorm or a conflagration? It is that? Well, no, those, that, those are elements of it, yes. But the, yeah. what, what I'm describing is you're using the forces of, 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 of physics and chemistry to reduce how many actual bombs you would have to drop. And these are people like think this stuff up. Um, mm -hmm. one, one Neil, I'm very grateful that you didn't use your formidable gifts for ill. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. If you if you decided to become a bad guy, <laughs> we, this world will be over. And, like, no, no. It's about time we had a black supervillain. <laughs> I'm pulling for Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, black supervillain. There's not a the... doesn't uh, well, happen. I, uh, one thing again, I, just to end it on a completely down note. Um, I have more than once, and it's never received well. I don't know why, Malcolm, maybe you, you have the answer to this before we go to our third segment. But people talk about sort of the violence in the cities or violence during wars or terrorist attacks. And there doesn't appear to be bandwidth to hear the following fact, that from 1939 to 1945, so the, the, the duration of the Second World War, 1,000 people per hour were killed in the name of that war. Ugh. Oh my God. That's terrible. Per hour. And there is nothing today where people are dying at that rate. And so much lower things get people's, you know, astonishment. And I'm just thinking, you know, people alive today were alive at a time where that went every hour from 1939 to 1945. And, yeah. and so, yes, the world used to be worse than it is today. I'm just, yeah. you know, put that out there. God, we got to take a quick break. When we come back, um, we'll try to land this plane. It might be hard because Malcolm is, an, is, a, is a fount of <laughs> enlightened insight into you're the, the human one who condition. just told the birthday cake story i don't know why you're, <laughs> no. why you're telling why you're pointing at me that's supplemental to your to you what just, you just you just taught a generation of listeners how to like create a firestorm at the on their birthday <laughs> cake did. and you're you're, you're telling, that was not my you're intent. telling me that i'm <laughs> i'm just very observant if i see stuff that's all and so you could you could you could actually put candles adjacent to those candles inward and they would each light their way into the center i mean you could do that experiment anyhow we're gonna take a break when we come back more with the one and only malcolm gladwell on star talk we're back star talk co-host chuck knight chuck it baby hey all right and malcolm gladwell uh and, and malcolm i feel like i know you even though we've only met a couple of times only because your books are so accessible it's like you're a friend of mine sitting next to me and that's a talent that you've honed ever since your days at the New Yorker, um, and I, I just want to. That's wanna, a I, dangerous I, talent. 
That's a only, very dangerous talent, man. Only in say. the hands of the wrong person. Okay. okay. Right. That's the theme. That's the theme of this conversation. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's right. If we all turn evil. So <laughs> in Revisionist History, like I said, it's one of my favorite podcasts out there. Um, you open your season with a discussion of self-driving cars. And, you, and, and this is a little weird, and I don't know if, you know, do you need to be checked out on this, where you try to get a self-driving car to hit somebody. What did you try? What? Tell me what happened oh, in this episode. First of all, let me just say, bravo. That, <laughs> well, that's I read, I, I, for some reason, I stumbled across this paper by a guy who said, he was like a, an urban planner, and he writes this brilliant paper where he says, now, wait a minute. If all the cars on the road are self-driving, then that changes the psychological dynamic between cars and pedestrians. The reason you don't jaywalk now, or you jaywalk, we do jaywalk, but we jaywalk pretty sparingly, right? The reason everyone doesn't jaywalk all the time is that we're really worried that someone who's driving a car is either crazy and will hit us, or distracted and will hit us. We know we don't jaywalk all the time because we know that the human drivers of cars are imperfect. Self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, are, they're not absolutely perfect, but they're really close, right? So this guy says, well, if the fear of an imperfect driver is removed, what do you do if you're a pedestrian? You jaywalk all the time. You could walk out into the middle of a freeway, b you, blindfolded. A hundred percent, and they will all stop. They'll all right. stop. They will all stop. So I thought this was such a hilarious, Observation. So you need to program in <laughs> some psychopathy. You need some psychopathy wait. programmed <laughs> into that car. You guys, wait a second, wait a second. You guys are absolutely right. Wait, you've jumped ahead of me. Oh, you've sorry, 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 sorry. Wait, wait, we're getting there. Yes, yes, yes. The answer is yes, yes, yes. So right now, so <clears throat> I go to uh, Phoenix where Waymo operates, Google's Waymo, and that is the only place in the country where you can hail, like an Uber, you can hail a self-driving car. It'll come pick you up and you drive around. So we got ourselves a Waymo, and we drove around in it for a while. And it, was, it is clear, the, dr the driver, the, 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 the algorithm, the AI that's driving Waymos is the nicest, kindest, most patient, most long-suffering driver in the history of drivers. This is a driver who never gets angry, who will never flip you the bird, who will never lean on the horn, who will never speed up when he should be slowing down. It's a perfect driver. So then I said, oh. Oh, they actually slow just... down when they're approaching the, a yellow transition between oh, yeah. a, a green and a red. <laughs> never run. They'll never do anything. They're perfect. So yeah. I said, oh, this means that I can do whatever I want. So I got out of the car. We were in a, we were in a parking lot of a Alamo draft house in Chandler, Arizona. And I got out and I started to mess with the Waymo. <laughs> and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give it away. But I was like running next to the Waymo and I was trying to see whether if I behave like an idiot, what would the Waymo do? Right? Now I know what I what a driver would do, a human driver, if I right. did hit me. But what about what would happen if you know? Um so it was this great reminder, first of all, that the People who come up with new technologies don't always think through all of the implications. No one thought when they came up with the idea for autonomous vehicles that what they were really doing was liberating pedestrians to do whatever the hell they want. <laughs> uh -huh. That, was that not wasn't on, their on the mind. table. That, that, that was, was not on their mind. That was they were not like, oh. there. <laughs> and I realized, you know, if you if you make every car in Manhattan self driving, you realize that you'll no car will be able to make it down the street. Right. Right. That's true. Yeah, I mean, it'd be impossible. Yeah. My track club meets on the Lower East Side, and we're all we're competing for space on one little lousy little track with all of the walkers and you know whatever. If every car on the road was self-driving, we would get on the the FDR drive and do our workouts at rush hour on the FDR drive, and every car would stop <laughs> yeah. and wait until we were finished. Right? So it's like right. I found this idea so fantastic. It's like amazing. It makes, it means the really, really, really cool thing is that it means, and the good thing is it means you, you'll be able to ride your bicycle through any American city without fear. Mm -hmm. right. And that means you will always ride your bicycle, right? The only thing that's preventing us from riding our bicycles everywhere is that we're legitimately 
scared of getting hit and killed. Right. Now I've removed that possibility. Okay, what so all right, so just just to be clear, okay, um, you know, when as they say, uh, when they invented American football and people were cracking their heads open, this is a, a joke from Jerry Seinfeld, right? People, not a joke. It's a it's a comedic observation of reality, uh, cracking their heads open. So rather than say maybe we shouldn't play this sport, they said let's still play the sport, but now wear a helmet, okay? <laughs> so so maybe. You just have to add extra rules that constrain pedestrians so that the traffic can continue, and that's a, that's a solvable problem, right? Yeah, it's. So I thought you were going to say the. I thought you were going to say what you guys said before, right? Which is <laughs> maybe the response is you program the AI into being crazy, it's just a little bit crazy. <laughs> just, just a little. So you don't know. Just you have little. that could be the one 90, that doesn't stop at the red light. Yes. Yes, ninety-five right. percent certainty they're not going to hit you. <laughs> right, but that. The minute there's five percent, right? Then you're like everybody's you're thinking to, now. Everybody's reconsidering. Now. Right, I, right. Malcolm, yeah. let me ask you something. That I don't have an answer to, and I've thought deeply about it. And you're exactly the kind of guy to think about it and write about it. So right now we lose at least thirty thousand people a year to traffic deaths. That includes pedestrians. I think thirty-five thousand a year. So that's a mm -hmm. hundred a day, and that's been that way for decades. Okay. Mm -hmm. You introduce self-driving cars, and that number drops to near zero. But yeah. initially, it won't be near zero. It might be thousands, okay, yeah. of deaths. And these are deaths from errors in the software, right. or the, the 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 pattern recognition software thinks it's a clear road, but there's a truck in the way. That's and actually happened. It, it has actually happened. So, how do you convince people that two thousand deaths are better than thirty-five thousand deaths? If those 2,000 deaths are from the errors of a machine built by somebody in Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, you're right, it requires some persuasion, but I don't think it's framed properly. I don't think it's a difficult proposition for people. I mean, I am 100% in favor of the autonomous driving revolution, even as I recognize it creates a strain, a, an interesting world where you can't actually drive a car in a city anymore, which I'm fine with. Get rid of them as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I do, and also, I think the transition, you said eventually we'll get to zero. I think we'll get to zero really quickly because I think these AI systems okay. learn Real really fast. quickly. Mm -hmm. They're fast. I you mean, know what is, has you essentially will, gone to zero? Are airplane deaths. It's essentially yes. zero. Right. They're essentially zero. Yes. And if you, I was talking to the, the engineers at Google um, who, who have created Waymo. And if you will tell, if you ask them, they'll say, you know, just in the last two years, two years, Waymo has gotten like so better. The, the experience of driving, of sitting in the back of a, of, of a Waymo in, in um, Arizona is you can perceive the difference between now and two years ago. Oh, wow. The, okay. The car is just, driving a lot more, the AI is driving it a lot more smoothly. It's, it's, there are fewer situations where it seems to be confused. Fears, yeah. It, um, I was stunned driving in the back of this way more. It, it, it's amazing. I mean, it's, and I think that's the other thing, that once people experience the, what it feels like to be in these vehicles, what you quickly realize is how much better it is than you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're much less likely, I think, to be concerned about the occasional mistake. Plus they don't because, consume ethanol. Um. Right, or electric. <laughs> yes. right. Yeah. yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. But the, the other thing, Neil. In your, in, your, in your highball drink, yes. The other thing right. is the insurance companies are such uh, benefit from this so much that what they'll be able to do is put together and make a fund where you pay people a lot more if they are harmed, either either in an accident or if they're killed. Oh, wait, well, we'll run you down. Like there was the the initial accident that happened. Remember, there was a fatality involving an autonomous vehicle yes. in in Arizona, in Phoenix, I think two or three years ago. And it was because a woman <clears throat> crossed was jaywalking and she had a bicycle. Right. And what happened is the autonomous vehicle approached and the AI had a category for bicycle and a category for jaywalker for human jaywalker but no category for human and bicycle and it was confused it never seen this before and it didn't know what to do and it was going back and forth between is it a bicycle is it a human is it a bicycle is it a human and while it was undergoing this this so that's ai artificial decision, idiocy 
because any yeah, human right. would know that difference, okay? Yeah, <laughs> it hits the woman. Now, the point is, that only happens once, right? That if your system is set up properly, the next time you have a category for that. And that's it's what's like going building on codes. Nowadays. It's like building yeah. codes. Every like code in there is because something happened uh, that yeah. where people died for, yeah. for, for construction and fire. Um, so, so, so Malcolm- Now I'm wondering why there's a warning to not put my cat in the microwave. <laughs> Somebody did it. Somebody. Uh, all right, so, so I agree. So this would rapidly converge on something being completely safe. So what about the case, you know, the, there are these trolley quest problems, right, in, in, in sort of mm -hmm. moral philosophy. So if, 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 if it goes left, it kills one person. If it goes right, it kills two people. But it will have to kill somebody, so it goes left and kills one person. Is this mm -hmm. the kind of uh, ch decisions it's going to have to make? Or, or is it going to be so good it never has to have a trolley problem? Well, the it's interesting. The trolley problem um, assumes out the possibility the trolley can just stop. Right. right. So there's a third. The third strategy is you avoid having to make the decision at all by sacrificing the efficiency of the journey. Mm -hmm. And what I think AI these AI, these are called in in AI parlance in autonomous driving parlance these are called corner cases. A corner case is this difficult tricky to decipher kind of case. And my understanding is that in most of these car corner cases, what the car does is it just stops. So, Got it. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, I think it's it always just, safer. It's, it's always safer yeah. to just stop. Right. It will always take the, it will, it will do what we're reluctant to do as human drivers, which mm -hmm. is to compromise the efficiency of the journey. The, the, the AI will always do that. That's one of its great advantages, by the way. It's never in a hurry, mm. right? Right, I, right, right. Somebody should, I would imagine that if somebody figured out what percentage of fatal accidents happen because someone is in a hurry, it would be an enormous number. They, they, they change the warnings on, on signs. They say traffic and, you know, 20 minute delay, plan for being late. Because yeah. once you plan yeah. for it, then you don't have to rush anymore because now everyone expects you to be late. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a psychological uh, dimension of, the, of the, inf the, the, the helpful sign information on the freeways. Yeah. But so let me ask you, Malcolm, humans are programming these AI and then they sort of continue to program themselves, perhaps. So mm -hmm. what about the uh, the possibility of bias introduced? Mm -hmm. And let me just give a fast example. You, you surely read the news articles uh, in the last year or so where they had uh, racist sinks at airports. <laughs> OK, <laughs> because. <laughs> So you go to the sink and I always wondered, I put my hand there and I said, oh, I guess it doesn't work. And then a white person comes behind me and then the water dispenses once they put their hand on me. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it, it's checking the reflectivity of the skin. If I have dark skin, oh, the signal does not get back to the sensor. It gets absorbed. So it thinks nobody's there, right? right yeah. So I always thought it was just- Sorry, a... black man. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You're gonna have to have dirty hands. <laughs> dirty <Sorry>. hands. <laughs> so, th so, this, so this made the news, all right? So yeah, I'm yeah. just wondering if I'm a black man crossing the street at night, is the AI going to know I'm there? Was it going to think clear street ahead? Keep going. And then okay, I'm, now let me, then let me ask black this. man in the street. Here's, here's the caveat to that, Neil. What? Are you Malcolm Gladwell black? Are you Neil deGrasse Tyson black? Or are you Miles Davis black? Because guess what? One of y'all is dying. <laughs> you know, this is real. I always tell my girlfriend, who is a lot darker than I am, she's black. I was like, I always tell you, if you, you're out, she's out at night in Manhattan, like, I was like, you can't wear black. I'm sorry, you cannot wear black. Don't, are you nuts? Like, <laughs> wear a bright color for God's sake. This, <laughs> and she just looks at me like I'm a madman. But I, I, you know, anyone who's driven at night knows when, when, if someone, now this is not just black people, but when some, a person dressed all in black crosses a street that's badly lit at night. It's a problem. It's a problem. Right? Correct. It's a, right. Where, why do people, I, my fellow runners, we would run at, in, at night and, you know, on a, on a winter's night in the, uh, on, a, on the streets and they would be wearing all black outfits. I'm like, you're, you're crazy. What are you doing? Where are you? I always wear a yellow jacket for a reason. I don't want to get killed by some car who can't see me. Right, right. So, so these are humans making that mistake, but when your machine makes the mistake or you don't yeah. know to put in as a programmer to put in some test, or, or if you test it only on white people and think yeah. that it's good for all humans, then this is, a, this is a bias. Even if the person themselves 
are, are if they themselves are not racist or, or or in any way they have it was sort of an unintended consequences of only thinking that white people are who's uh, uh, you know you know it's a great example of this Neil I was listening to something on these AI systems and they were developing an AI system to to um diagnose um, uh, dermat uh, um, for dermatologists to um, diagnose, uh, to figure out whether something on your skin was cancerous or not. And they went to all this work and they thought it worked really well. And then they realized that what the AI was doing was looking for the presence of a ruler because in all of the images it was using to learn from, <laughs> they were textbook images where there was a little ruler next to the spot to measure how long it was. <laughs> If there's a ruler, it's cancerous, clearly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So like, but, like, but no, but that, I do think that's a transition problem, right? That's the thing about, I totally, it is 100% true that AI systems, when you're starting out, reflect the biases of okay, the Okay, we got to kill a few black people first, and then, then yeah. we're, we're on cue, I guess. Right. <laughs> but you don't, but, you know, over time, I think it's reasonable to assume, by the way, here I am on a podcast with, Neil Tyson, and I'm the one defending science. <laughs> You're the one. Yeah. What is going on here? <laughs> what? I, I'm like, guys, no. Scientists know what they're doing. No, you and know what it is? It's like, just Chuck. These guys are crazy. It, I can't wash my hands in the airport. <laughs> what? It's Chuck. If I spend too much time around Chuck, I become angry black man. It That's is true. <laughs> it is true. I will you, do that to you. You have, this is, this is, yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> so I just, I, I want to end, I wanna, we got to, uh, again, land this plane. Um, could you retell the story that I first heard you tell us on stage? Um, what happened when you first started wearing the afro? Okay. Oh, I grew my hair out. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you, you for, grew your hair okay. out, and you, you got that sort of Art Garfunkel kind of afro there. T tell me, well, just could you please retell that story? Well, it's. I mean, I always feel sheepish telling this story because. Um, but you're in a safe space here. Go on. I'm in a safe space. So I, my hair used to be, my hair reflects the fashion of the times. So when every black person is wearing their hair real short, I was wearing my hair real short. And then there was a moment, you know, when everyone started to grow their hair long again. So my hair can grow, can be quite considerable. <laughs> so when I, in the kind of, about 15 years ago or so, I grew my hair out a lot and discovered, of course, that I was getting stopped left and right by cops <laughs> on the most trumped up of, like, the most absurd, you know. No, I wasn't even, I wasn't even speeding half the time. Right. And I'm I sorry, was... sir. I'm going to have to ask you to step out of the car. <laughs> sir, I'm in the back of a cab. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, officer, but I think you got, you're talking to the wrong guy. <laughs> it was but Afro then, on a Sunday morning. That's the, that's the, it's in the rule book. <laughs> and then, and also at, at um, after 9-11 in um, airport security lines, mm, I was wow. getting pulled out. And I realized that the part of the informal algorithm used by cops and security officers was, you know, big Afro codes for something questionable, right? That's just a, I was just, I don't think it was a kind of active malignant racism. It was just like- It's being lazy, things, actually. It's really lazy. It's laziness. Yeah, there are yeah. certain things that trigger. So you're a cop and someone goes past you at 55 miles an hour. Okay, maybe I was going a little bit faster. But, um, <laughs> and you know, you're not getting, it's not like you're focused on the individual. You're picking up a few key things. Is the person driving a sports car. Are they, right. is the car shiny and new or old and ratty? In my case, they see me drive by and they see a big Afro and they're like, oh, all right, let's go get that dude. Right. I think that was what was going on. <laughs> but it was just like, I didn't, the last time I'd had a big Afro was before I had my driver's license. So I'd never been through this very American rite of passage, which is if you resemble something even remotely black, you get pulled over a lot. Mm -hmm. So I just was introduced to driving while black. You know, <laughs> okay. my first- Welcome to the club, okay. <laughs> Welcome to the club. I was like- <laughs> it was, Not, Well, I, uh, I have always been able to alleviate that problem personally because I drive with a driver's cap on all the time. Oh, there you go, so uh, you're the butler. Uh, you're it the, just uh, makes me look like I'm somebody's chauffeur. You're driving Miss Daisy, that's who you are. That is a, that is a, quite a defense. That's good, yeah. You're, I got it. I need one of those hats on my dashboard. Yeah. That's yeah. like a that's like a throwback. Yeah. It's a throwback defense. Yeah, right. Yeah, take exactly. it back to the days. You're like a porter in the airport. Yeah. Like, and it's, it's, yeah. yeah. Uh, guys, we got to we got to call it quits there. Oh, Malcolm, man. it's always a delight to chat with you. You're such 
you, uh, we love your perspectives on the world and, and your capacity to share those perspectives is unmatched uh, in all of your media now with podcasts and books, even books with long titles, <laughs> it's long subtitles. Um, good luck on, on that book. Thanks for bringing that story to the front. I think the world needs it and anyone thinking of the future of war needs it. Uh, so, um, Chuck, always good to have you as co-host. Always a pleasure. So, Malcolm, I want to put, a, if it's possible, you know how some people have a standing um, uh, a table at a restaurant, you know, once a month. I want a standing invitation with you for every next project you do, you come on the show. <laughs> oh, I would love that. Thank you. This is so wow. much fun. In that case, we'll be seeing you once a week. <laughs> once a week. <laughs> Jeez. Be, be careful what you wish. I, I know. I know. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to call it quits there. This has been Star Talk, the Malcolm Gladwell edition of Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. People, hang out. <laughs>